is that the ones who channel real entities is kind of low level anyway because no high level entity needs to take over your body in order to transmit information if they're so high level they can just instantly download into your mind and you know it instantaneously without giving up who you are your persona mm -hmm. so the act of channeling is in itself in my mind a form of carjacking hmm you know it's like you know you get out and i get in that that's uh that's a new perspective for me on channeling. I know that people don't accept that because they've been conditioned to believe that it's a positive, wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the disinformation. And so you think the whole goal of that program is to lull people into doing nothing? Absolutely. And if you take all the information that's been channeled mm -hmm. and lay it right next to each other, they're practically identical. And absolutely none of the predictions have ever come true. They're just there to lull you into a false sense of security. Hmm. Well, that, well, that's an interesting, uh, another topic. Uh, see, we can go on for hours with these subjects. Let's get back to Montauk, yeah. though. And, okay, let's just say here it is, day one, reporting to duty. How were you taken there? Uh, and what was your responsibility initially? My First of all, we would get there through these wormholes for the most part. Okay. Sometimes we would physically be transported in vehicles. But for the most part, we would be taken at night, um, and it would be through the wormhole. Mm -hmm. When we were there, depending on who you were, you had different functions and responsibilities. In the very beginning, my job was to become a booster or power pack for the psychics on the chair. Uh, one of whom was, was Duncan Cameron. And they used the energies of young teenagers or young children to boost his energy or whoever else was on the chair so that he could open up a vortex mentally that could then be downloaded into a computer system as a software. And then that could be replayed without him personally having to do that. What they found was, and what they were trying to do, was to use the human mind to create software that could be downloaded and saved on a computer program and then used and manipulated at will. Did you ever see these computers? Yeah. In the beginning, they were different than they were at the end. In 1970, some of these computers looked like they took up the peripheral of an entire room. Mm -hmm. Some of it was Earth technology. A lot of it was not. In some of the rooms, where they used the children for specifically was to induce a heightened sense of fear and anxiety that would then be transmitted to these poles located at the four corners of the room that would literally absorb the energy of the fear and anxiety. Hmm. That could then be amplified and broadcast out into the public because mind control works best on a person who is afraid. Sure does. If you create a, uh, a situation of panic and anxiety, that person's mind pattern is open to the point where they can be manipulated very easily. Could they broadcast that to an entire city? Oh, they have. They have. Do you know of any uh, examples? Yes, uh, the, the riots in L.A. in 94. Was that an experiment? That was an experiment to see what would happen if chaos existed in a large American city. And they, they were successful with that. What they were trying to determine was what would people, how would people react if it was announced that there was an alien invasion? What would happen in a large city? And could they actually contain it is what they wanted to know. Exactly. Right? And as fast as it started, that's how fast they turned it off. Huh. Very interesting. Now, did you prepare the boys in any way? Yeah, I did. Could you describe that for us? Well, in the beginning, I would prepare them um, like a little military soldier. They had to act in a certain way. They had under penalty of being uh, hit or punished. Mm -hmm. um, they had to they had to have their physical bodies prepared in a certain way. Um, they had to um, really be frightened and anxious and build up the frenzy and very often they would use my energy 
to create this, this state of anxiety and fear in the room. Now, you were 15 at the time? I started when I was 14. I didn't get to do that part of the work until I was about 16. W were you a pretty big guy? Well, I was bigger than most. Yeah. Uh, and, but these, these boys were just little kids, weren't they? There were many age groups. They were as young as infants in some cases to about three. Hmm. Then the other group was to about eight or nine. Mm -hmm. And then from 10 to puberty. And then uh, there was a whole range of, of groups from teenagers into early adult. Did, did you ever have to beat them up? Yes, we did. It's kind of hard to... As, as I listen to you and, and I hear the emotion in your voice, I personally cannot see how you would ever agree to that. Well, I can only tell you that it is one of the, the biggest, it is the biggest regret of my entire life. Mm -hmm. And in fact, with my own children, I have, to, I have to look at how I speak with them and treat them and how my reactions fall back to the Montauk reactions that I used to have. And uh, my children will tell you that I was a very strict disciplinarian. When they were young? Yeah. How old are they now? Well, I have a very wide range of children, um, the youngest being 22 months, oh. and the oldest being uh, in his 20s. And I've been married a couple of times, and I have different sets of family. Okay. Um, but my, my youngest children, I am specifically careful of how I talk to them and treat them because I don't want to replay the things that I did when I was younger. But, but how? How in the world? I mean, this is not your natural substance. Well, the, the listener has to understand that we were not consciously doing these things of our own free will, although I do believe there was a part of our mind patterns that allowed this and accepted it. Mm -hmm. So we have to take a look at that. And I believe that they were activating our reptilian brain. Mm. And so we didn't really understand or know what we were doing, but we were indoctrinated to believe that it was the right thing. Okay, you're, you're tying a lot together for us, Stu. I mean, thank you. Um, you know, as, um, as Preston called it, he, he said it was his alternate reality when he was there. Yes. You know, it wasn't this reality. It was a different one. Um, do, do you feel the same way? It was like a dream state. Uh, now, when you were there, let's just say I knocked on the door, they let me into Montauk. W would I have seen anything? Would it, been, would it have been a different dimension that you operated in? Well, if you were actually let into the area, it would have been quite physical. Mm -hmm. I mean, you would have seen physical bodies and physical machinery and equipment. Now, the, the, the non-physical part exists when they, they would send someone interdimensionally mm -hmm. or when they would hook you up to a computer and you would go into an altered state. And very often when they built up this frenzy in the room of fear and anxiety, the, the overall energetics of that room would put you in an altered reality. It would be like a living nightmare. Hmm. Wow. That's the only way I can explain it. Yeah, so so how long were you there from age 15 till... Well, what? I was 1970 to 1983, so I was from the age of 14 to 27. Wow. Now, during the day, did you have a normal job? Yes, I did. And I worked for, for a company that was related to the Montauk Project. And the symbol of that company was the Ankh. The Ankh. Yeah, that company no longer exists. What is an Ankh? An Ankh is an uh, Egyptian symbol, which looks like a capital T with a loop on top. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it stands for uh, eternal life, as well as um, the liaison between physical and non-physical reality.